Hey, everybody, you are listening to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast, where we will be tackling real financial issues so women can eliminate fear and take charge of their lives. I am your host, Kimberly Davis, and I am the Fiscal Feminist. So let's get to it. Do you see that more and more people are now getting prenups? I think I read 30% of millennials have them now. Definitely, there's an increase. I see an increase in my practice. I mean, we're getting calls almost daily now for prenups. And a lot of young people who are getting prenups who want to make sure that they have spelled this all out and that they have been very transparent with their spouse-to-be. I sort of think it's because a lot of them have seen the parents, frankly, get divorced. That's what happened in my in my kids. I mean, they saw the horror of my divorce and they're like, yeah, we're not doing that. I think that people are very aware that divorce is extremely expensive and they want to make sure that they have covered themselves for, for that possibility. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast today. I am very uh, excited, as I am for most of my guests, but super excited for today's guest because we're going to talk about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, as you all know, if you've been listening to me. And I have a question for all of you out there. Do you ever wonder in a divorce, what happens if the woman is the primary breadwinner? How does that all go down? Because like when we talk about it, generally in, you know, everyday life, most people think it's the woman who's trying to get something from the man. And that's always been the historical narrative, which is quite frankly, a bit anachronistic. But um, I think this is going to be a really interesting podcast. And for all of you out there who are wondering about this question, then you need to listen to this podcast because you're going to get some answers and you're going to understand this space a lot better. You're also going to walk away with some tactical tips about what to do if you happen to be that woman. And without further ado, I would like to um, introduce you to my guest today, Lisa Ziderman. She is the managing partner at Miller Ziderman LLP, which is a matrimonial law firm. She is also a certified divorce financial analyst. So she's um, a matrimonial attorney as well as a certified divorce financial analyst. So she's checking all the boxes. Um, she handles these, you know, complex financial situations and custody issues in divorce. And um, she's uh, quite a, quite a uh, notable lady. She's been named to Crane's New York list of notable women attorneys for 2022. She's a Hudson Valley best lawyer in 2022, uh, 2021 best family law attorney for client satisfaction by the American Institute of Family Lawyers. And on and on. So she's got chops, okay? This is not some random, like, lawyer. Okay, this woman knows this space very, very well. So I want to say thank you, Lisa, for taking time out of your busy and erudite schedule to share your wisdom with us and talk to us about all the things that we're going to get into today. Thanks so much, Kimberly. I'm thrilled to be here and excited to talk about this topic. It's, it's not often that I get to talk about this particular topic. Yeah, I also want to mention that you do a blog for Psychology Today called Legal Matters, Understanding Mental Health Issues as They Apply to Divorce and Child Custody. And um, I think we all need to remember that this experience, and I know from my own experience with divorce, um, is very mentally challenging. So you have a lot of issues going on when you have a divorce, right? And one of the things I was reading your um website. And one of the things I often mention and you have front and center is, um, you know, putting together your team, you know, your team of interdisciplinary experts when you do get divorced. And that could be anybody from the therapist to the lawyer to the analyst and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, this isn't just about fighting in court or trying to get your due. It's also about trying to you know, not lose your mind through the process of this all. (laughs) So I'm going to start today because I want to, I want to jump right into this female breadwinner thing. So we're the kind of the overall umbrella topic today is what female breadwinners, you know, need to be aware of in marriage and divorce. But before we even get into that, can you define what a female breadwinner is? Who is that person? Sure. So in my practice, we have many female breadwinners and that person is the person who we call often the moneyed spouse also, which is the person who is earning um, the majority of the income usually. And maybe in fact, 
earning the only income that's coming into the household because that person may be the primary breadwinner as opposed to the primary caretaker of the children. Or, um, and what this is something that we see so often, that person may be doing essentially both jobs. And so very often we have the primary breadwinner who is female and at the same time, that person is also making sure that the children have their play dates and that the children get to the pediatrician and that the nanny is there. And if the nanny isn't there, they have to be there and um, so on and so forth. And so it's almost as if there's a dual role that many of the primary female breadwinners are actually doing. And that makes this case so much more difficult in so many different ways. I mean, okay. I love the fact that you just said that. I say this ad nauseum to anyone who will listen to me. So first of all, I've said this before and I'll say it again. And I said it in my book that I wrote, The Fiscal Feminist, A Financial Wake-Up Call for Women, in case anyone hasn't heard me yak on about that. Um, You know, 75% of all caregiving is done by women, whether they're a Oh, they work or they don't work, or they're the primary breadwinner. And I was just looking at some statistics that forty-two um, percent of mothers are either the sole or primary family breadwinner, and forty percent of breadwinners in homes with at least one child are women. But yet, because we don't advocate for ourselves in our home, we'll go out and maybe advocate for ourselves somewhere else in the workplace. But, and even we don't even do that as much as we should, but we will not negotiate with the people in our home, i.e. our spouse or our partner to say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm doing all this work. Could you help me out at home? Could we kind of figure this out? So I can only imagine if you are in a divorce and you're caring for the children as well as doing all the stuff, you know, for the job to support the family, this must be like Armageddon, you know, just trying to figure out how the future looks. So, okay, so we know now what uh, the what a primary female breadwinner looks like. And there are more and more of us out there because the stats are saying 40%. That's a lot of ladies out there, you know, carrying the torch and burning the candle at both ends. So what are the key financial considerations that, you know, female breadwinners should be aware of when entering marriage? And then I'm going to ask you, well, I'll let you answer that, but I want to go down the prenup, the importance of something like that as kind of a stopgap measure so that down the road, all of the, you know, the, you know, what doesn't hit the fan because we didn't plan ahead. Sure. So I'm going to say one thing first, and, and that is that the cases that I have where I have the female breadwinner, those are the most difficult cases. And they are the most difficult cases because women don't often take care of themselves in terms of making sure that they have protected their finances. So I would say that that's a huge issue. And and women who are the primary breadwinners have to be understand that they either have to enter into some sort of an agreement, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but they can be responsible for child support later. They can be responsible for spousal support, and they also are going to equitably divide in New York. And, and you know, some states it's different, but I'm a New York um, attorney, so I'm going to talk about New York. Um, mm-hmm. They equitably divide the the assets, and of course, the liabilities. But um, the fact is that many women who are the primary breadwinners wake up to a divorce, and even if they started the divorce, and they are shocked that they are in a situation where they are paying child support, paying spousal support, and equitably dividing those very assets that maybe only they earned. Now, the good news is, and I and I, I really have to emphasize this, is that they are the primary breadwinner. So they have the ability to earn in the future. And it may be that the spouse that they're that they're married to is not able to earn in the same capacity. So, you know, we always talk about this for women, right, who are Mm -hmm, stay-at-home moms, that they don't have that ability to climb the ladder, that, you know, 20 years from now, they may actually not have that earning power. The primary breadwinner who is female is going to have earning power. And Mm -hmm. that is something that is so important for women. And they can't overlook that 
when they are unfortunately having to be in that situation where they are paying spousal support, they are paying child support, and they are equitably dividing the assets. Because believe me, they are far better off most times yeah, of course. Than, yeah. than the stay-at-home mom who is waiting for the checks to come for spousal support or child support or fighting for those every, you know, all of those dollars to be able to maintain a lifestyle. And so while it's painful for the the female breadwinner to write these checks because frankly they just can't they can't fathom it in most cases that they are literally writing child support checks and they may have been doing everything and yeah, but yeah. but that is just that, I mean that's a crazy double standard right because you know with a stay at home mom and I don't want you know don't shoot me everybody but the stay at home mom's going to have been picked up the slack right she's going to be doing all that stuff and, and so she deserves to get paid for her invisible labor that she did for a bazillion years and the career hit that she took and that she didn't contribute to Social Security or her 401k, yada, yada, yada. But, okay, so in these uh, primary uh, breadwinner, female primary breadwinner households that you are representing, what is the partner? Is the partner working? Is they working part-time? If they're not caring for the children as much, what the heck are they doing all day? Well, some of them are not doing much, unfortunately. Some of them are caring for the children. Okay. So, you know, there's no generalization. There are definitely stay-at-home dads that care for the children who are wonderful um, support systems for their for their um, spouses, okay, for their wives. And that is great. Um, unfortunately, I think the ones that, the, the, the couples that we have seen are um, situations where either the um, husband has been underemployed or the husband is not really working at all. And on top of that, maybe um, not taking care of the children to the fullest either. So the mom is still right. going to all the children's events and juggling the job and, you know, making sure that dinner is on the table. And, and it just, it is a recipe, frankly, for the divorce because there is of just course. uneven division of labor. And at some point, everybody is just, uh, you know, uh, is so... Um, perturbed by the situation, the stay the stay at home dad feels that um, he's doing too much, or maybe he is threatened in some way by the fact mm-hmm. that his wife is earning all of this money, and the 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 wife who is out there working is thinking, "I'm doing the double jobs here," and uh, you know my partner isn't really being my partner. Now that is not every case. So let's just be clear. There are many, many stay at home dads that are incredible support systems for their wives in much the same way that wives have been support systems for their husbands for many, many decades, right? And, and, and years. But I, I think that we're not necessarily seeing those cases. We are seeing the unfortunate truth of the other cases. Ignorance is not bliss. As women, burying our heads in the sand when it comes to our money has dire consequences. But yet, so many of us have employed this detrimental strategy. After over two decades of experience, I've discovered that women face a twofold crisis of competence and confidence regarding how they approach and handle finances. It's time to close that gap. I wrote The Fiscal Feminist, a financial wake-up call for women to teach women how to take charge of their money and control their financial destinies. This book will help you achieve financial literacy, establish the right tools and rules for managing your money and relationships, and to plan for your future. It's time to gain and maintain financial wellness on your own terms. Head to FiscalFeminist.com to order your copy today. Right. And honestly, I mean, not to be too controversial here, but if the guy's doing a grand job as a stay-at-home dad, then maybe you don't want to divorce him. Exactly. Um, And I mean, also some of this goes on to the women too, a little bit, because I've read, and I think I have this in my book somewhere too, that even when women are primary breadwinners, like 30% of women, or maybe it was 20%, don't hold me to this, but it's between 20 and 30% of women will actually kind of lie about the fact that they're the primary breadwinners and like make it out like their husband is making more. So it's like, you know, again, it's our very old historical narrative, you know, values that are defining this narrative that hopefully at some point are going to dissipate over time, but they are holding on 
with, uh, you know, holding on with everything they've got to us. But, you know, it makes it really hard, I think, for sometimes for couples that all have role reversal, which even in itself is an anachronistic term, um, you know, and they, and they don't want to admit that maybe the woman's making more than the man. But I mean, you know, it's really becoming more and more common as time goes on. So, okay. So we're in this situation where this woman is exhausted and she's making all the dough and she's trying to take care of the kids. And she's like, okay, I'm fed up. I want a divorce. Um, but what, so what can she do before they get there? Like, should she be trying to talk to her husband? You're kind of into the therapy thing. Should she have an, a, a prenup? Hey, if, if we divorce, this is how it's going to go down because I know I'm in California, but I do believe this is across all marital law. You can only put alimony in a prenup, not a postnup. Is that correct? No, that's actually not correct for New York. There are some states that oh. that is correct for, but New York, we can. Put I think alimony. California is. That's how it is in California. Yeah. So, like, so you can actually put uh, alimony to postnup. Yes, then. absolutely. In New York, you can definitely so, do it. So, say I'm. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm making some good money. I'm making more than my partner. We are not, um, we don't have any kids right now. We're going to get married. Uh, what are you going to advise me to do? So I'm going to advise you to enter into a prenup. And, and this is, I think, very key for women who have, um, ambition in terms of their careers and who want to build their careers and who, um, intend on, you know, certainly climbing that ladder, um, perhaps becoming partners in law firms, um, becoming managing directors at, at financial institutions, um, et cetera. And so I think that this is a fabulous conversation to have before you get married and certainly before you have children, right? What is going to be each of our roles? And, and I ask this question when I actually work with, with people who are, at, who are entering into prenups, who are coming to me for prenups. And this is definitely the conversation that I have. And I will say that I see more and more prenups where each party is going to be holding on to their own income, their own, mm -hmm. um, their, their own assets, their own retirement assets, et cetera. And I see many, many women who are entering into prenups with the idea that they want to make sure that they are financially secure, that they are not paying spousal support, that they are saving their income and their spouse is saving his income. And they will, um, they will each be responsible for a portion of the household expenses and so they may have one joint account where they're putting enough money in, mm -hmm. in some sort of a ratio, whether it's 50-50 or some other ratio to pay household expenses. And they are also making sure, and this is really super important, they are making sure to protect their premarital property. Because many of the mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. who are the um, breadwinners, okay, or who have built careers, they may be getting married a little bit later. They may, you know, not be in their 20s or early 30s. They may be a little bit older. Perhaps they've even been married before and gone through this, but they need to be protecting their separate property, their premarital mm -hmm. retirement assets, their, you know, their apartments, their homes, all of those things, because a lot of women come to me and they already own some of these assets. And so they right. need to make sure that they maintain these assets and the prenup. And they don't become commingled with the marital corpus. Exactly. And so the prenup can not only um, define what's going to happen with, with the separate property, but it can actually define what's going to happen with spousal support. And therefore, there is an incentive for if there's no spousal support. And you've already decided this ahead of time, and everybody knows what the game plan is. Then there's an incentive for both parties to be earning, right? Because you know somebody's not going to be as apt to um, give up a career and stay home and um, rely on spousal support when there's no spousal support coming. And so there's also that there's, so there's that part of the conversation, but there's the other part of the conversation, which is perhaps as a female, 
We want a support system from our husbands. Perhaps mm-hmm. we want to know that we are going to be the breadwinners and perhaps mm-hmm. we are going to agree that we're going to pay spousal support in the future because we need that support system. We need somebody who's going to stay home with the children while we travel, when we're in the meetings, when we're networking at night, when we're doing all of those things. But again, that should be built into the prenup so that everybody knows what their role is really going to be. And what about this idea, um, because I have this and one of my daughters has this in her prenup, um, who is and actually lives in New York, is if one of them, she's a lawyer at a big law firm and her husband also has a good job. He's not a lawyer, but, and she's probably maybe not going to be as inclined. Maybe she will stay home. Maybe she won't, but either of them could stay home. So instead of it being couched in the terms of spousal support, it was more of a settlement. So if one person were to stay home, then whatever, whether it's part-time or full-time, kind of trying to come up, you know, using a formula, what would you have been contributing to? What were you making? What percentage of that maybe you could be getting if you take X amount of years off? And then, you know, what were you going to be contributing to Social Security or your 401k? And then somehow that's like your base settlement. So you get something, you know, not, not nothing. Um so there are ways of making sure that if someone were to stay home, because the couple may say, well, we don't want our kids to be totally, um, you know, cared for by not one of us full time. Maybe one of us wants to work part time or I don't know, you know, everybody has different feelings about that. Some people are, are good with both people working and figuring out childcare, although childcare is expensive. So um, and it's becoming more expensive as we know because all of those subsidies have been eliminated. So a lot of people, you know, are going to have to make that decision. So when you are counseling, you can only, I'm assuming in New York, it's the same. Each person has to have a lawyer at the prenup that represents them. That's what should happen. But, you, you know, I often think like maybe it would be great if people could do financial therapy before they, then they go and do their prenup because they've like actually talked about it in a more calm environment, you know, and they're trying to figure out the best way forward. But um, do you see that more and more people are now getting prenups? Because I do believe more millennials have them. That I think I read 30% of millennials have them now, primarily because they have a lot of student debt. And I think they want to kind of figure that out. I think it's um, definitely there's an increase. I see an increase in my practice. I mean, we're getting calls almost daily now for prenups. And um, and a lot of young people who are getting prenups who want to make sure that they have spelled this all out and that they have um, been very transparent with their spouse to be um, and that they have taken care of the situation. Maybe it's because I, I sort of think it's because a lot of them have seen the parents, frankly, get divorced. Yeah. And the expense. That's what happened in my in my kids. I mean, they saw the horror of my divorce and right. they're like, yeah, we're not doing that. And, and there's and I think that people are very aware that divorce is extremely expensive. And yes. particularly, you know, in New York, I'm sure it is in California, too. But um, I think that people are very aware of that and they want to make sure that they have covered themselves for for that possibility, because it, it, it certainly they see their friends, they see their friends, you know, their parents, they see their parents' friends who have gotten divorced and the stories are not necessarily pretty. So I'm sure that that's part of it. Um, I think that they are being much more transparent about what they want. Um, and I think it's a good time for people to start to think about, are, are we going to have children? Are we, mm-hmm. who's going to, to your point, stay home and be with the children? Um, Are we both going to take time off? Are we, you know, but I also think, and you mentioned this, you have to be super careful that what you're drafting is actually going to be enforceable and that Mm -hmm. it's going to be something that everybody understands what it is. So this, this concept, this hybrid concept of, you know, if you don't work, then I'm going to um, pay you perhaps spousal support or there'll be some lump sum. You have to be super careful that this is very clearly set forth in these prenups. What does that mm-hmm. actually mean? Does that mean I can work part-time? Does that mean I can work from home? You know, all of these um, nuances, it, it's very mm-hmm. important because you're now going to be relying on this document. And I'm going to tell you that when you get to, to that point, this document has to be understandable. 
Right, right. So it's it takes, I would say, look, don't be penny wise and pound foolish with this stuff. I know people kind of balk a little bit. They don't want to pay the money for the prenup. But think about this. Down the line, this thing could save your bacon and make your retirement and all the other part of your life down the road. Because if you have a really messy divorce and things don't go according to plan, and I'm the post, you know, I am the poster child for this, um, then this trickles down into your retirement and, and how long you're going to have to work. And, you know, what, you, you know, how are you going to get, in, if you happen to live to 100, how are you going to get there? Because this thing could just be like a, a apoplectic kind of thing to your finances if it's not handled wisely. So, you can do your own prenups, definitely online, but I would say, um, I know there are resources for that now, but I would say it's worth putting money towards a prenup um, because this is going to be the defining document down the line if, you know, if things go awry and it's worth it because that few thousand dollars that you're spending on the prenup could save you hundreds of thousands of dollars even more down the line. And so... What So like, just on a list, just if I can recap and you please interject, if you are going to get married and you especially, well, not just this goes to everyone, but if you are the primary breadwinner and you're a lady, um, I would say, you know, just make sure that you have a prenup and you, and don't feel embarrassed about asking for a prenup or thinking that, you know, that doesn't make you like less uh, in love with somebody. In fact, it should solidify your relationship and your ability to talk about things in an open and transparent way. If you can't do that before you get married, I hate to break the news to you, your marriage isn't going to last very long. And then secondly, uh, be careful how you co-mingle your assets. So keep all your separate property separate and make sure it's in your name and your name only. And if you have a trust, make it, it put it in your trust, that will become your separate property trust. And then also, um, you know, be intentional. And I think Lisa um, refers to this in how you commingle. Like put your paycheck in your checking account with your name on it. And then if you want to have a joint account, then you can say, I'm going to put, you know, 20% of my pay into the joint account and you're going to put 20% of your pay and that's going to be our joint account. And from that, we will go on vacations and pay the utilities and buy a house or do whatever you're going to do. But don't, like there are financial influencers or whatever you want to call them out there that I have heard um, one woman in particular who says the minute you get married, you should commingle everything. And this is based on, this is like a Christian based valued influencer. Wow. Yeah. It's a little scary. Uh, I, I'm just saying uh, I'm not trying to violate the sanctity of any kind of partnership, but that doesn't mean that you have to combine your money. This is a patriarchal notion that will most definitely screw the woman down the line. And I don't care if people want to argue with me about that because I'll stick by that. So be intentional how you commingle. Even it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean you don't love your spouse or you don't love your partner or you're just mean spirited. It means that you're being sensible. You're acting like a man would act. So I'm going to add something because this is something that comes up so many times. Many times people will come to me, and this is frankly male or female, um, and they'll say, I'll say, do you have any separate property? And yes, I had separate property. I had premarital property or I had an inheritance, but don't worry, everything's in my name. Okay, that's great. And then I say, the ne- and then I ask the next question, which is, okay, but when you were earning during your marriage, did you put that money into the same account as your premarital property? Or did you put it, and did you put it into the same account as your inheritance? And then the answer is yes, but don't worry, it's all in my name. And then I say, but here's the problem. You have now commingled your separate property with your marital property. So it's very important that people understand just because it's in your name doesn't make it all yours. You have to go that next step. You need to keep your separate property separate. So meaning I had this premarital property and I didn't add any income that I earned during the marriage. I just left it there by itself. It went up, it went down, whatever the market forces were, somebody else was managing it because that's that's another complication. We won't get into it now. 
but essentially I just left my separate property separate or I got my inheritance and I put it in a separate account. I did not add my income. I did not transfer any other monies in. I just did the cleanest thing possible. I left it there. And then I had my income and I put that into my account. And then I did the best thing yet. I had my prenup and my prenup said any income that I earn during the marriage that I keep in my name is going to be mine. And that was the best thing okay. I did, right? And now you covered all of the different parts and made sure that you are your your money is secure. And also what you did was you made sure that you each had attorneys, that the agreement got to everybody prior, you know, wasn't just the day of the marriage, okay? Yeah, you yeah. You gave plenty of notice so that everybody isn't um, saying at the, you know, I've got this at the last minute. I can't even think straight. How could you do this? I start, you're starting your marriage on your wrong, on the wrong foot. So you've done a lot of things that actually will help prepare you for your future. And to your point, so that you're not sacrificing your retirement. So I want to ask you one quick question here because I, I'm intrigued by this and I didn't completely know this. So if you put your paycheck into your checking account with your name on it, and then you take your amount out to go into the commingled account, so that's over there. When you get into a divorce situation in New York, the money that you've been putting into your personal checking account in your own name could there be attribution to that, that that's part of the marital corpus? Yeah, sure. If you, if I am earning income, I earn income every day, right? And when I earn income, mm -hmm. it goes into, let's just say, in my case, it does go into a joint account, but let's say it goes into an account, okay? It, into that account, that's my marital monies, right, that I am earning. And so therefore, it is subject to equitable distribution. If you think about it, it makes sense because for years, okay, there were no female breadwinners, okay, or very few, right? And men were earning all of the income and then they were putting it into their name. And what would their stay-at-home wives have gotten? Nothing. So all of those accounts in your name alone that you earned during the marriage, they're all up for grabs unless you have a prenup or a postnup that says something different than that. And the biggest mistake that people make is that they come into the marriage with, in some cases, millions of dollars of assets, right? Mm -hmm. In some cases, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands, okay? Whatever it is that they come in with, they put the monies that they earn during the marriage into those same accounts, and okay. they think that money is safe. It's not safe because now they've just mixed their separate property and their marital property, and now the court has to actually divide it up in some way and maybe they get some credit if they can show that they have this money, but they've commingled it with marital monies. And that is a problem. So the, so what I'm taking as the two takeaways for this is, is um, one, make sure that your, that your prenup says that, can your prenup say everything that you've earned is not marital property? Yes, you, it can. It can, it can literally say that. And then what what is safest is if you agree that you're going to have some joint account because there's usually going to be some bills yeah. that have to be but but essentially yeah. you can definitely say that it can definitely okay say so that. Uh, you, you're going to say oh, my income is my income it's not part of the marital property and um whatever i choose to commingle that's what i choose and that's part of the marital property so that's the first thing you've got to do and then i forgot what i thought the second thing was you got to do but um Make sure that's on the schedule. Oh, and never put money that you earn after you get married in an account that has an inheritance from your mom and dad or your aunt. Um, and also, one question I want to ask you, say I own a home uh, before we get married and I want to keep owning the home and I want it to remain my separate property, but we're going to live in the home. How do we thread that needle? So... The safest is a prenup because <clears throat> essentially the prenup will say that, um, you know, you own, it'll be on a schedule at the end of the prenup and it'll say, this is your sole and separate property now and forever. Now, it also may say that any mortgage pay down will be your separate property, no matter who pays it down. It also may say that the appreciation of that particular home is also going to be your separate property. 
And it also may say that if you sell that property at some point, that any subsequent asset that comes from that property, right, where the source of it is your your home, that will be your separate property, okay? Now, it can say all of that. It could also do some other things, okay, to make the prenup perhaps um, fair, okay, which is that any marital monies used for the pay down of the mortgage will be split um, 50-50. So the amortization essentially of the mortgage, let's just say you have a home that is, I don't know, half a million dollars, and now you have a $250,000 mortgage and you're both paying that off. You could literally say that the amortization is going to be split 50-50. So maybe you're going to get that first 250 of the 500,000 and then off the top when you sell, and then the rest of the home will be split there's so many different ways you can do it. And we do them all, by the way. We speak to mm-hmm. people very carefully, you know, very closely, and we try to find out what are their goals. And their goals may be that they kept the value of the property from at the time that they got married, but the appreciation may become marital or not. The um, pay down of the mortgage may become marital or not. Maybe there'll be some credit in some way. Maybe, um, you know, there'll be some percentage that goes to their spouse in the future because they are living in it. Perhaps there's renovations, capital improvements. There's so many different variations of this. And to your point, prenups are not, you know, they're, they're, they're costly because somebody yes. is putting all of this together for your future. And so it is important to understand that all of these are things that actually, when you, when you, unfortunately, if there's a divorce, you're going to have to figure all this out. And if you have a prenup, it's all in there. Yeah, it's, it's going to make things, it's kind of like not having to go through probate. I mean, you still have to go through the process, but you've already figured it out a lot ahead of time so that you're not like, and the problem is, is that when you are to the point where you're going to have a divorce, you kind of, and I said this before, you don't like each other. So you're not going to be in too much of a negotiating mood. And it usually also means, and you know, I've said this as well before, because I think a lot of women don't have their finger on the pulse of what they have in accounts, or they don't know what their husband's accounts are. And, uh, you know, like you, you kind of mentioned in your website, um, you know, you don't know if you don't know that your husband has, or your partner has a restricted stock, or if, you know, stock options or cryptocurrency, and you're not like, on top of like looking at your tax returns when you sign them and knowing what the assets are, when you do get into a divorce and you're kind of starting the process of discovery, people may not be so forthcoming with information. Um, You may have to like really get very, you know, this, you can subpoena it, but some people could drag their feet. They might not be very transparent. I don't know. I mean, they, they should be, but doesn't mean they are. So what, what kind of advice do you have to, um, also, you know, just on a more global kind of uh, topic with these assets, it can be um, all these various assets that could be involved in this. You know, it's just not pay. It's also all these other things. Like, what are your what is your advice to women in general? I'm, I mean, maybe if they are the primary breadwinner, they are more likely to have them than not. Um, but if they are not the primary breadwinner, um, how – This is a little bit of a going off topic, but what should they be looking for so they know where to look for this stuff? Okay. So first of all, are we talking about finding the assets? Is is that- Yeah, like I know, because I think a lot of women don't really, I I have people I know who reach out to me and they have no idea even what their husbands make, let alone if they have cryptocurrency or restricted stock options. So look, it it is my feeling, right, that- women need to understand what the assets and the liabilities are in their marriage. And, and, you know, you've read and talked about a lot of things that I have on my website and I've done a lot of um, podcasts about financial abuse. Um, And I think that there are, there is definitely financial abuse. In fact, I think there was a bill just passed in New York about financial abuse. Um, It just literally came across my desk the other day and I have to look at it more closely, but it is a form of domestic violence for sure. Yes. Um, And Mm -hmm. women who are, I would say, particularly women who are not in the workforce are, and who don't have the earning power are particularly susceptible to financial abuse. They are also less likely in my experience to, um, push and um, to find out 
what the assets, the liabilities, and the income are because they are not in a position of power if they're not earning. Mm -hmm. They're dependent on their spouse to actually to dole out this money. And so it's really important that those women who are deciding to um, stay at home and support their husbands and support their families um, by devoting their time to this, that they understand that they do have power. And if they don't actually have power, then they can't be at home, frankly, because they are going to be left in the dust. And the world is not very kind, certainly not New York, okay, very kind in terms of spousal support and in terms of taking care of people who don't take care of themselves. And Mm -hmm. so it's really important that those women, those women who are going to stay home and take care of the children, okay, and support their husbands and you know, do all those things and and give up their financial earning power. Those women have prenups and that they negotiate hard for those prenups and that they make sure that they have a good spousal support package and that they make sure they have a good division of asset package and that they make sure that they understand where the assets are and that they look at those tax returns. And if they're not doing that, they are making a huge mistake because they are yes. sacrificing their earning power and they are really looking at a very serious situation down the road if they get divorced or even if their husband dies. Exactly. I mean, look, it's not only divorce, there's death that could occur. And I've seen this happen in my practice and people are just like, they don't know the time of day, right? And it's it's a mess. So like, there are so many things to walk away from with this. And I have a couple more questions before we wrap up, but all I can say is it. We are not allowed not to be on top of this, okay? It's just because you're staying at home with kids, which is, I know, a huge job. And quite frankly, I found it more demanding having three kids two years apart under the age of six than I did being an associate at Wilkie Farm Gallagher. Um, But I understand it's a lot of work. and You you don't take showers for days and you've got all these little kids like bugging you. But you need to stay on top of this because, you know, if the dream doesn't survive, and even if it does, you're not like, we can't keep adding to this old fashioned notion that women shouldn't know about money. It's completely ridiculous. So all I can say is we have to take responsibility for ourselves. And I'm not, you know, trying to wag my finger at y'all, but I am. I need you all to listen to this podcast and walk away and say, I am not going to give myself permission not to know about this. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to know what accounts we have. I'm going to read our tax return. I'm going to ask my husband or my partner if they have stock options and how they get compensated. Do they have a cryptocurrency account? You know, what the heck are they making? What's in their 401k? And find out what those accounts are. You know, I tell people, like, if you think you're about ready to get divorced, don't just, like, walk out. Like, figure out do some like, you know, uh, sleuthing and get all of your information in order before you pull the plug. Cause otherwise you're going to, you know, you could be in a very bad situation. So these are very important things. And, you know, Lisa's in the front line of this. So she's seeing it every day. So, you know, like, please listen to her advice because it's like legit advice because she's seeing real life people go through some real life situations here. I want to go back to the female breadwinner thing for a minute. What are some of the misconceptions or stereotypes about female breadwinners in the context of marriage and divorce? And, you know, how are they treated differently? Uh, Is it different? So I think that female breadwinners um, particularly are very concerned about the custody of their children. And I would Mm. say that they... They believe when they first come to us that maybe they are not going to be worthy of having custody of their children. I would say that's the biggest um, fear that many of them have. And on the other side, okay, I will also say that many of them are not going to be what is the primary, okay? Um, They will likely... If they're, if they're good parents, and I'm assuming they are good parents, they're likely going to be in a 50-50 type of situation, a joint custody situation, okay. okay? Which is perfectly fine, right? It's perfectly fine. But they they should not have the fear, okay? Because that's, I think, the, the most common thing that we see is that they have a fear that because they worked, they are not entitled 
to be with their children. Well, there's plenty of men that we, frankly, have 50-50 custody for, okay? We do it right. all the time. And they work and they have child care. And just because you work, it doesn't mean you're going to be punished and not be able to be with your children. Um, look, I have women who um, have very high powered jobs and many of them organize their schedules. And, you know, sometimes we do um, a two, two, five schedule or a, a seven, seven schedule, right? Um, those women organize their schedules so that some, some nights they might work later and mm -hmm. some nights they may come home earlier if they can do that. Right. Or they have great childcare. Um, but they should not, I, I think that's the biggest issue is that they're afraid because um, they are the primary breadwinner that they are going to lose their children. That is not so. So let me ask you a quick question there. So say there's no prenup, there's nothing. And then you're a high powered woman and you've had maybe the dad doing more of this, the caring or the stay, at least he's staying at home. Um, and you go to a litigated divorce. Is it, do judges... So you're saying judges are not going to penalize you for being a working mom. I haven't seen the, the women be penalized. Now, maybe women feel that they've been penalized, okay? Right. Because they are not getting primary custody of their children. In other words, they're not getting that schedule where um, they have most of the nights with, with their children, okay? They're getting more of a 50-50 or, um, you know, something in that range. I don't think that's necessarily a punishment. I think it's just a reality, okay, um, of right. working, right? That that it, it's just that simple. You you can't be everywhere at once. And you know, I know this this whole idea of balance, but you know, I'm not so sure balance really is a reality in life um, because mm -hmm. I, I think that yeah. <laughs> you know you can't have everything at the same time. It's just not possible. So I don't think that they're punished. I do think that. However, and this is the thing that really, really, um, I would say, makes so many um, female breadwinners angry, is that they may end up having to foot the bill for their spouse's legal fees or a portion of it. And in New York, we have um, law that basically says that there is um, the moneyed spouse is going to pay the majority of the legal fees for the non-moneyed spouse. And the moneyed spouse is the breadwinner. And so it may be that you are paying the legal fees for your um, stay at home, um, you know, partner. And that's just the reality of it because you are making most of the money. And that is the way it is on the opposite side. Exactly. And, and again, I'm going to say it's not something, look, I, nobody wants to, to write those checks for the other spouse's attorney. And I get that. On the other hand, you also don't want to be that person who actually is looking to get that check from your spouse and yeah, you can't pay your attorney and you can't get the money right away. And you'd much rather be the one writing the check. That's my view. Okay. I know it's painful for so many women to think that they are doing this, but again, it may be just the reality. Yeah. And look, money is power, right? He who has the gold writes the rules. Exactly. So, you know, like I understand, like I've been everything. I've been a professional. I've been um, a stay at home mom. I've been a working mom. I've been a single mom. I've been divorced. I've been remarried. I mean, I've worn all the hats. Okay. Every single hat I have worn it. And I got to tell you something. I love my children and I've had this discussion with my daughter who's 33 and thinking, you know, about starting a family and is a lawyer. And would I do it all over again the same way? Uh, no, I wouldn't. And, it, and I don't think my kids would suffer from that. You know, like it was great. I could sit on the floor and play blocks with them and all that. Yeah, it was all good. But in retrospect, the hit that my life took from that and also my own self-esteem, forgetting the economic aspects of it, I wasn't able to self-realize in the way that I had hoped to. I'd gone to law school, I worked on Wall Street, and then all of a sudden I didn't. And then I, I kind of sacrificed my career by moving to another country for my husband's career. Then I came back in my 50s and had to create, recreate, which is why I'm going to work for a long time, not only because I like to make money, but because I'm still self-realizing. And But there's nothing more... Um, wonderful for your self-esteem and your security than having control of your own money and being the person, you know, I mean, if you have two, if you have a couple and you're both making the same amount of money, that's great. But usually that's not the case. So it is a trade-off, but 
I think that you are in a more dangerous situation when you are not the primary breadwinner. Whoever, whether you're a man or a woman, that's just the way it is. So I wish it weren't that way, but that is the way it is. Um, so my final question, and I always like to look at things on a kind of poli- not, well, a policy kind of level, um, especially when it comes to things having to do with women and children and just parity and the whole nine yards. But what could we as a society and pol- policymakers do better to help female breadwinners and ensure, you know, their overall financial well-being? I I get that they're the female breadwinner, but we as women have suffered a lot. We still have more obstacles than men. Is there something in particular that could be done in this area or or not? Well, look, I, I think that there should be more financial education in, um, in, in the schools. Okay. I think that that would be really important because I think that if there was more financial education and if people understood this portion of life better, um, you know, maybe in college, maybe, um, there should be a program about this. Um, I, I think that that would be helpful. I think that we need more financial education just generally. Um, I think it needs to be not just for, for the female breadwinner. I think it needs to be for all women. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, you and I talked before we went on the air about Savvy Ladies, for example, and Savvy Mm -hmm. Ladies is an organization. It's a not-for-profit where um, there is a free financial helpline, but we all, and women are paired one-to-one free of charge for, um, with financial professionals. It's a great organization and I'm super passionate about it, but we also host webinars and um, and panel discussions, all virtually, and women can tune into it and and be a part of it. And those and these are the kinds of discussions we often have. We do a um, a five part series, for example, on divorce um, in January and in February, and women can come on free of charge for um, that Zoom and. Um, they can learn about prenups. We actually have someone who speaks about prenups during during that and um, postnups and divorces and valuations and how to read a tax return and all of those things. So I think that financial education for women is a must have. And I think that there should be funding for it. And I think that there should be an emphasis on it in the school system early on um, and and, and I think there should be greater support for this. And I think then women will be a, as as apt to be in this different situations that they are. No, I agree. And I, I say, you know, I think there's only three states that have e- any kind of financial education as a requirement in high school, not just for women, but for anyone. And I think everyone can benefit for financial education and knowledge. But I think especially women, because we still... I think as a society, don't talk to our daughters as much about it as we should. And we still have some of these antiquated notions about it. But it's also kind of changing the narrative in our heads that it's okay for women to know about money. It's okay for them to talk about money. It doesn't mean that they're like less feminine or, you know, they have all those stigmatized kind of things that they think about women who are, you know, knowledgeable about money and, you know, represent themselves and advocate for themselves, that they're somehow lesser women, they're not as nurturing or caring. That's just like, if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. That's a reality. So this is the, um, you know, this is the oxygen mask thing from the airplane, right? You need to do this for yourself. And I've often said too, that, you know, when you are not in control of your finances and somebody else is controlling them or your money's controlling you because you just don't know what the heck's going on, your stress levels are going to be off the charts because money and stress are inextricably linked and it will cause you to get sick. I know when I went through my divorce, which was just an absolute nightmare, um, I was so stressed out. I was like, my face was contorted. My blood pressure was high. I drank more. I literally didn't get a good night's sleep for five years because that whole thing took five years to get itself resolved. And it was not, it was, I just, it was horrible. So this is about your health almost. (laughs) 
I mean, just, you got to be proactive. You're not allowed to just like drift through life and just get in relationships and, you know, commingle your money and not know anything about it and do all the caregiving and also work all the time. You know, we, we like need to wake up and get with the program. So I agree with you. These are things that must be done. And we as a society need to talk more about it. But as women, we've got people like Lisa, who's, you know, out there representing and trying to get women to learn. The savvy, um, how do they find out? I mean, I've spoken with Stacy before, but I'd like people to know how they resource Savvy Ladies. So they would actually go to SavvyLadies.org, it's a website, and then there is a whole bunch of ways to um, connect. And um, once they get on the mailing list and once they, or they sign up for the helpline, they'll get all the information um, anybody who's interested also could always email me at lz at mzw-law.com. I'm happy to connect them with Savvy Ladies um, and, and, and do that. So, um, but there's a lot on, there's also a LinkedIn website for Savvy Ladies as well as a Facebook website for it. And then if anyone is in New York and needs representation in a prenup or in a divorce, I think you need to call Lisa because, um, you know, she's, I think she's the woman, the woman to go to. Uh, I mean, I think you're just, you're so knowledgeable. I'm, I'm just really happy that we were able to, you know, pick your brain today because I think everything you said is super important. So if there's anything anyone can take away from this podcast today, what would you say they should take away? I think it's about financial education and also about the fact that your, your power is in your earnings. And if you don't have your earnings, then your power is going to be in your prenup. And so it, it's really that simple. Okay. The power is in the prenup. I'm actually writing that down. I'm going to use that. I'm sorry. I'll it's okay. Give you I, I just thought of it actually, but I realized that that's really where the power is. I mean, I'm, I love that. <laughs> that was that was like a brainwave. Okay, we're going to say it again. Your power is in your earnings, i.e. don't just quit working. Like earning money is a good thing. And it also gives you purpose. Besides being a mom, which is fantastic. I love being a mom, but I also like being other things. Um, and so if you don't have power in your earnings and the power is in the prenup, so there's no reason not to have at least one of those two things. Okay, that's what you take away from this podcast today. Lisa, you are awesome, sister. I love you. And I love what you're doing. And thank you for representing women and raising consciousness and giving your time to savvy ladies and just being an all around great gal. Thank you. Um, and next time I might have to have you on again, because there's like a million other things I want to talk to you about. Love so this it. could be like a, you know, 15 part series on divorce. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right, guys, thank you for listening to me today. Thank you, Lisa, so much. And until next time, uh, I shall uh, see you guys next time on the next podcast. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening today to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast. Please take a minute to subscribe to the podcast on your preferred podcast platform. And I would really appreciate if you could also rate and review it. You can also find me on Instagram and TikTok at The Fiscal Feminist or check out the website fiscalfeminist.com.